Why should you attend church? When I was growing up in Waco, Texas, and KCEN Television, uh, Waco Temple, they would always have the Dub King Sports Parade on Saturday. Whenever they would end, Dub King of the Sports Parade would say, and tomorrow make sure that you go to the church or the synagogue of your choice. Do you all remember that? When people would say that? Go to the church or the synagogue of your choice. That somehow back then in the 1950s and 60s, there was just the sense that we needed order. That you needed to be in your family, you needed to be good in your business, you needed to be good in your in your country as a patriot, but we needed something bigger than just national defense, that our country needed order, something that was bigger than us. You know, whenever 9-11 hit, it was interesting, but we made an announcement that uh, we would meet at the church at 7 to pray. And when I got there, the place was already about half filled. A lot of people didn't even know that you were supposed to come at 7 to pray on that Tuesday in 9-11. But people just came there like homing pigeons. They just knew that's where I wanted to be. I didn't want to be at the gym. I didn't want to be over at the university. I didn't need to go to the hospital. I needed to be at a church. I needed to be in the presence of people that believed in someone who was final and sovereign and authoritative. And so people just came from all places, people that weren't even part of the church, just migrated there. I think that is why when Constantine uh, became the, uh, Christianity became the religion of the Roman Empire, that uh, shortly after him, Christ he, he made it that that was the official religion. He was head of the church and the head of the state. And there was not just freedom in the church, but there was compulsory attendance at church. Now, that's not good, but you see his sense that there shouldn't be, he was kind of alarmed to think that there would be anybody within his empire that did not have a sense of Christ, that it was alarming to him. Not to restrict freedom in a sense, but it was alarming to him to have people that were chaotic, that did not bow themselves to the sovereignty of God. So what you do is you witness and you evangelize and you teach. You don't put out edicts that you have to go to church, but nonetheless, you can see the, the even though it was maybe a distorted wisdom behind Constantine and Theodosius later on, that was their idea. And that's why the idea of a separation of church and state, that there is no dogma to the state, that is a very new idea on the philosophic uh, marketplace. Do you all know that? It's a very new idea. It hadn't been tested that man can be apart from God. Man has to be under God. It has to be voluntarily. But the idea that man can exist apart from God and a state can be strong apart from God. That you can have God up here and then do your regular life over here and make him what you want to be and be free to be anything you want to. That is not just something that rationally doesn't hold true. It's not just something that's biblically fallacious. It's a brand new thought of thinking. People have never thought that until really about the uh, late 1700s, going in the 1800s. And we haven't done well since then. And so, why should you attend church? You know, we built this church in a certain way. When we came from the mill and came over here, I told the architect, we, we had seen, I had seen so many people come into church through all of the years, things had changed. When we started the church in 1976, 77, uh, I remember our, we were mostly college students and singles, and I'm not making this an edict, but if we ever sang anything that wasn't part of the red accepted hymnal of songs that Jesus sang, <laughs> if you ever sang, uh, God is so good, God, everybody started making fun of you. And these were young guys. They, they had been raised with me back in the 50s, the 40s, 
some of them in the 30s, and they just had a sense of the dignity of God. Something happened in the millennium, though. I remember one Sunday hearing my son was saying, he sat in church and he kept hearing, ding, ding, ding. And he looked around, and there was a guy working on his fingernails. Ding, <laughs> ding. And my son just kept looking at him. He said, I was ready for him to pull out them big yellers and start working on his toes, you know. <laughs> or the Sunday I heard a cell phone go off, which can happen. And it's an older guy. And I see the guy over there go, yeah, what's happening? <laughs> and he's chatting. And I wanted to hit him with a Bible, right? I mean, put a big RSV or whatever right on his head. Right? <laughs> and I began to see guys come to, they would come to church late. They would drag in. They would sit in the back and chat. Some of them come in semi-naked. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to have shoes on. And I thought, you know, something's happening. Have you ever felt that? Something happen is happening, and it ain't good. And so I told the architect, I said, I want a church in the architecture, because our architecture is, is uh, visual spirituality. Architecture is, uh, says a lot about what you're feeling. And I told the guy, I said, I want a church that when you walk in, I want you to take your hat off. I want you to have a sense of decorum that you're among the people of God. And he showed me the first church and it looked like Gothic. It looked like Bela Lugosi went there. <laughs> it really did. It looked like a vampire cathedral or something. I said, no, close, but that ain't quite it. I said, I want it a little warmer. I want Opie and uh, Aunt B to be able to go there. And he came up with the front of this with the Greek columns and I said that's it that's it and that's why this is my favorite place to preach because he did that he he made it that easy and so why do you take the time to attend church one of the guys at our Dallas seminary board meeting he said we were talking about some things at the seminary about launching ahead he said let me it was Dennis Rainey of uh, family life he gave the stats of guys that are they're males age that attend church, the stats of guys my age and the states and the stats of kids today that attend church. And it was frightening. And he said, we have a nation of barbarians at the gate. And he said, they're about to mate and attract and breed. <laughs> and you better get somebody to them because they don't know sick them from come here about the authority of God. Amen? Amen? And so why do you attend church? Uh, why take the time? Why take the burden? Why take the responsibilities? Why drive on ice? Excuse me, I didn't mean to say. <laughs> why don't you just stay home? Why don't you go online and that way not have to be involved with giving submission or love? Why not just stay home on Sundays and cram your week with more distractions? Why not do more meaningless stuff? Amen. Yeah, that train always agrees with me, you know. <laughs> There's a, the, the engineer listens on, and we'll just crank it up right there. You know, in earlier times in our, in our culture, we, big churches were frowned on. You liked small churches because you wanted intimacy. Now we like the, the mega churches because now you can have anonymity. You can get maximum use and not have to be accountable or responsible. But you can get the best bang for your buck until somebody else across town does a little bit better deal. Then you go over there. You shop it online, see. Why do you attend church? I'm going to give you three reasons. You attend church, number one, because as Charles read, it's commanded by Scripture. We're not to forsake the assembling together. You don't miss church. You forsake the body. We are Christ's body. We are his temple. We are his bride. We're not an alternative lifestyle. We publicly make a declaration of him. We publicly herald him. 
and we publicly organize our efforts, our paper bags under our seats, our giving, our compassionate acts, and we come together in synergy of energy together to go out as a church and do good works and to make this world a more educated, wiser, kinder, gentler place. So you don't forsake, you don't go AWOL on the people of God. We're a kingdom of priests. We herald that good news. Number two, because we need this church. We need truth. In a world that is surrounded by lies and the father of lies. I've got a book at home called 101 Philosophies. It's about that thick. Why isn't there just one philosophy that everybody believes in? There's 101 because number 99 canceled out 98. Number 98 canceled out number 97. Number 97 said number six was crazy. Nobody agrees. There's no final word. It's a house of mirrors. It's just continual reflections infinitely on what, on a human figurine. And so we need final truth. I need to know Genesis through Revelation, the story of what God's doing. I need to know what's right, my moral duty. I need to know the future of where this cosmos is spinning. And I'm not going to get that from Fox. I'm not going to get it from CNN. I'm not even going to get it from Oprah. I'm going to get it from Scripture. Amen? That's where I'm going to get it. Number two, we need reproof. We, we need somebody. One time I was speaking to the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, the head of the our organizations, Les Steckel, he used to coach the Minnesota Vikings. He came up to me afterward, gave me a good jock admonition. He, he came up to me and he said, man, thanks for getting in my mustache. <laughs> That's what you say in coaching whenever you got to grab a guy by the headgear and get right in front of him where he can't miss you. He said, thanks for getting in my mustache. Are there times that you need somebody to get in your mustache? I see what you women are doing. There was a guy one time, my wife, I'm sorry, a girl told me that, that this guy was here with his wife and he, I would say some things and he would turn to his wife and look at her and say, you told him. <laughs> yes, you did. You told him. No. The Bible, if you hadn't discovered it yet, is not just a book that deals with doctrine, then another section of it that deals with application. God is in your mustache as soon as you open it. He is in your grill. He is in your face as soon as you start. That's why they say you can't teach the Bible as literature because the Bible is a tour de force of the holiness of a sovereign. And you've got to deal with it. And we need that. You need that. You don't need to be long out of the proclamation of truth. And that's why I got no business saying anything that isn't out of here. Because it's the only thing that will reprove, rebuke, exhort, and uh, discipline us for holiness. Thirdly, we need exhortation. I need a standard of what I am not because the world will continually tell me that I'm okay unless I buy this. I need something to call me up to something more excellent than I. Fourthly, I need accountability. Proverbs 18, 1, he that separates himself seeks his own desire. Whenever I see a guy that doesn't show up in church for a while, that ain't good. It's not that he has found better accountability or better truth. He may have found a better church, that's fine. But when he quits showing up with the body of Christ, that is bad. Because he's tired of God getting in his life. We need accountability. I need brothers in the Lord. I need elders at a church. I need truth. I need to submit myself to my elders and clothe myself with humility toward one another. I need, number five, intimacy. 
I need friends. Chuck Swindoll said when he became a Christian, the biggest thing he missed was the bars. Let me explain that. I'm not talking about bars you climb or bars you're behind. I mean bars you drink in. Swindoll was a Marine, fought in Korea. He said, I missed the bars. I missed guys just getting together and just talking, being close. And he said, that's what I love when he got into the Navigators. It was a bunch of guys close around the Holy Spirit instead of distilled spirits, you know. <laughs> that we need that kind of intimacy. When, I, when I'm weary in life, I need somebody to come to me and say, I'm praying for you and I'm with you. I've been there. I'm thinking about you. I need standards. That's another reason. We need to be in local church for standards. I need heroes. I, needed, I need Jerry and Marquita Strader. I need, uh, I need to remember Lila. I need Mary McSpadden, W.L. and Joy. I got a handwritten deal one time and big broken deals that I can no longer come to serve in the church because his Parkinson's found it unable to let him the scrawl of Walt Dyer. And I remember looking at that and, and choking up of this old man saying, I have been poured out. I got nothing else to give. I need Roy and Phyllis Robertson. I need Jerry Savore. These people that have gone before me who no longer sit here and are faithful till the death. I need those guys. I need their memory to inspire me. The memory of the righteous is blessed. I need a standard for my kids. I need my children and my grandchildren to know in life we're not just bottom feeders. We don't just take and take and take and take from this God who supplies us. No, we receive His Son, then we come together and we give and we serve and we pour our lives out as I was sent, so send I you. And we let ourselves be used. I want my kids in church to know that we have a responsiveness to our God. I want to show you a great Norman Rockwell. Johnny, you got that? There's a Norman Rockwell. Here's a mother heading with her two twin daughters. And she, you can't tell it, but she's got her nose up and she is insulted. Because there's this couch tater. And he's got his pajamas on and his bathrobe. And he's looking at the sports section. He's got his coffee below him. He's got his cigarette going. And you notice that little boy behind him? The, the women of the family have just spurned him. But that little boy is looking at him with his prayer book, and that little boy is confused as to why I got to go worship God and my daddy don't. That daddy had set up a tension. Norman Rockwell. I need also the exercise of my gift, and so do you that God has placed us in the body as he desired. And I need to be a good churchman. I need to be like the guy of 2 Corinthians, famous in the things of the gospel. If I'm a good husband, if I'm a good father, if I'm a good patriot, if I'm a good soldier, if I'm a good student, that's good. But I need to be a good churchman because I was created for God. And so I need to take the gift that God gave me and the gift that God takes you. And I need to get plugged in that the current flows through me and God uses me. So we attend church because we're commanded, because we need the church. It provides something that nothing else provides. And what nothing else does provide, we can't survive without it. And there's no plan B apart from the body of people that have believed upon the living God. And number three, I need you. You guys. I need Christians to force me out of my hermitage. You dig? To force me out of my aloneness 
and my drawing into myself. And it's easier today than any time in the history of the world to draw into yourself. I need to be Trinitarian. I need to be like God. I need to be personable. You know, they've started here recently a couple of, of uh, comedians out of Britain started mega, mega church, atheist mega churches. Have you seen this? Where atheists all come together and sing. I don't know what they sing, but they sing. Ain't nothing here, ain't nothing here. Hallelujah, ain't nothing but me. And I'm going to die, die, die someday. Hallelujah. What? You can't say hallelujah. You just quit. You know why they started it? Because one of the guys went to a Christmas carol service and he said, this is the neatest thing I've ever seen. These people are all happy. They're all, in, they're all in love. They're all full of joy. They're full of peace. They hug each other. They go out and eat together. He said, I love it. It's just I don't believe anything they sing about. And so it's interesting that an atheist recognized it's a neat social organization. It, it, it helps if you believe it, but it's just a neat social organization. It was Paige Smith, the great historian, that he said about Americans. He said, Americans have always been joiners. They create their own little institutions and join them. Because he said, throughout all of history, you were assigned your social setting by the strata you were born into. The rich, the wealthy, the merchant, the guild, the serf, the lord, the worker, the farmer, you were and you married within it. If you were Bob Cratchit, that's what you, where you stayed. If you were Ebenezer, that's where you stayed. And very lately and rarely can you move vertically. But he said America was built on vertical movement and it's based upon ambition. It's that American has to make money and buy stuff that guys that make money buy and live where guys that make that money live. Therefore, people can look at him and say, you've made it, and that's who you socialize with. But the problem is, he said, we're all lonely, that the American is the loner. He's the classic to heck with the system, to heck with the past, press on to the future. How many of you guys watch Jeremiah Johnson and just have a deep longing to go out in the snow and kill an elk? <laughs> There's just something about it. We love to go out and get all by ourselves. That's an American Teddy Roosevelt felt that the, the bald eagle should not have been the emblem of America. It should have been the grizzly. That's all by himself. Man of the mountains. And Paige Smith of Harvard said, that's the American. But as a result, he said, Americans are neurotic. They're always running. And he said, Americans are always lonely. Because they've voluntarily cut themselves off from everybody else. And so he says, the history of America has been the elks, the odd fellows, the mooses, the daughters of the whatever. He said, we create institutions so we can join them and we can be together. A church is all kind of people coming together because we get lonely. I need you to, here's the one another's of the Bible. We're told to love one another. That we're not just to be, and I'm not just to be a goiter, a tumor that just grows larger. I'm to give. I'm to love people. I'm told to encourage one another. The word C-O-U-R, Coeur. Coeur d'Alene, Idaho is the heart of the lion. The Coeur, encourage, means to give heart to somebody. Where you come next to some guy and you say, come on. I'm with you. You give them a slap and say, come on. You can do this. I'm praying for you. What do you need? You got a dollar? I got a dollar? You got a dollar? Come with me. We need comfort. Comfort one another. When I went through that depression, I had six people who wrote me and said, I've been there. I said, am I going to make it? They said, you're going to make it. I made it and you're going to make it. You're going to struggle, but you're going to make it. The Bible says, let all be sympathetic, brotherly kind-hearted, humble in spirit. We need to bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the Lord of Christ like Sam Wise to Mr. Frodo. You may be too weak to follow me, Mr. Frodo, but I can carry you. And sometimes the church has to say that to you. I can carry you if you can't go. We need to be of the same mind with one another. 
I need a classless society where I associate with those that are not like me. That's the essence, not of America, but of the church. We need to serve one another, to be truly human, to regard one another as more important than myself, to be able to give, to be what is truly great, and that is a servant. He that serves shall be greatest among you. I need to be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give himself a ransom for many. To put myself as beneath another man. To serve one another is to be truly human. To regard one another as more important is to be truly divine. And I need to be like the Father who creates and breathes life. The Son who dies and the Spirit who gives life to God's elect to guide us. That's the whole nature of God that he has loved. And when I don't do that, I'm alien from the very core of my existence. And I become an ugly, withdrawn, withered thing. I need to admonish one another. I need somebody to warn me. The word admonish means to warn. And there's sometimes guys start wandering and they need somebody to say, hey, you, you ever had somebody do that to you? I want to show you something. How many of you have ever heard of a guy named Jim Marshall of the Minnesota Vikings? You heard the name Jim Marshall? What do you think of when you think of Jim Marshall? He ran the wrong way. Scored for the other team. Let me show you why. Watch this. Myra straight back to pass. Throws, completes it to Kilmer up at the 30-yard line. Kilmer driving for the first down, loses the football. It's picked up by Jim Marshall, who's running the wrong way. Marshall is running the wrong way. Somebody and catch he's it. it into the Somebody end. help. Somebody talk to him. Somebody go safety. get him. He's all he alone. Hallelujah, I'm great. The now watch this joker from San Francisco. Thank you, pal, joy. you stupid idiot. His teammates were running along Here comes his brother. Hey, field, thanks. We really appreciate you doing that. Now that's what happens when you got nobody to talk to you. Now, wait a minute. How many of you have ever heard the name of Roy Regals? You hadn't heard of Roy Regals. You know why? Because he had a buddy. In this clip, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. All right. Georgia Tech has got the ball. They're driving this way. California is defending this way. We're in the Rose Bowl. Roll. Fumble. Go, Roy. Go, Roy. Oh, oh Roy. <laughs> Stop. Stop it. Run it back, run it back. <laughs> run it back, Johnny. What's the difference between Jim Marshall and Roy Regals? Jim had nobody. You see that guy chasing him? It's his best friend. <laughs> the guy's name was Benny Lom, L-O-M, and he chased him the whole way. And he's yelling. You're running the wrong way. You're running the wrong way. He thought he was yelling, run, Roy, run, run, Roy, run. Until finally, Benny grabbed him, turned him around, and he got annihilated. All right. <laughs> but sometimes you got to have somebody chasing. Now, you knew about Jim Marshall because he scored. You didn't know about Roy Regals because he didn't score. Because he got grabbed right on the edge by his buddy. And you need Roy Regals sometimes. I always thought about the name Roy Regal. It means literally uh, the royal king. <laughs> Isn't that a great name? Roy Regals. That's who you need to grab. Him. You also need to confess your sins one to another. Sometimes you need help with skin on it. And you need to talk to somebody and say, man, in my marriage... As a parent, my money, you need to confess your sin and say, I need some help. You need to pray for one another. There was a lady at our church named Connie Swisher back in the 80s that I visited with, and she was a, uh, 
uh, widow and she just loved me and she would send me letters and on the letters it would be written all around the apps of the letter with scripture and everything. She'd write the letter of just what she appreciated that I was doing and encouraged me and I would pick those letters up of Connie and they would just, just go into my heart whenever I'd pick a letter up. She was an encourager and she died and uh, I went, she had a stroke and I went over to Good Sam to see her and she couldn't, it hit her voice and she couldn't say nothing. And so now I got to do all the talking. And I just put my arms around Connie and I just pray with her and talk about how, you know, God and his plan, we all die. How we do is his purpose and he's with you. And so I got to, she spoke to somebody that didn't answer back, then I spoke to somebody that didn't answer back. And so I miss Connie. We need someone to forgive one another as Christ has forgiven you. Sometimes you want to start a church like Mike Shear said he was going to start called No People Bible. <laughs> where you just have a church with just you and you don't allow anybody else to come. You know, you've seen these churches where you have the congregation there, then you put the picture of the pastor. I'm going to start one where I'm there literally and we bring in pictures of the congregation. <laughs> And you pay $30 a hit and you can never talk to me. <laughs> Once we're done. Now, we need people that we have to be like God and forgive. We have to bear with one another to flex and let our moderation be known to just give way to each other. They have a place up in North where every year they have the dance of the porcupines. It gets cold and the porcupines come together. Then they jump apart. They come and jump apart. That's like a lot of Christians. I need you. Ow, dead gum you. Well, the church is the dance of the porcupines sometimes. How do porcupines run, nestle together? Very carefully. Very sensitively. I also need to be able to do not look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. A woman in the Bible named Dorcas or Tabitha, she died. Tabitha was her Hebrew, Dorcas, her Greek name. She died. And uh, they called Peter and they said, we can't take her dead. You got to raise her up. And they all stood around with the garments that she had knit for them in her life. And they dried their tears with what that woman had done for them. And so we need to look out for others. This is pure and undefiled religion to visit widows and orphans, to be sensitive to other people. We need to speak to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in our hearts to God. We need to sing along together. We need to raise our voices together and all of us congregate like orphans around a fire unto God. And then we need to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. That word stimulates the Greek word paroxysm, which is a violent onrush of symptoms. A paroxysm is when you really, someone gets right next to you and shakes you up. Generally, as we go through our Christian life, there are events that occur that are milestones. With me, when I was young, I heard Dr. Howard Hendricks get up and say, you young kids are looking for something to commit your life to, and it's got to be as eternal as you and the souls of men are, and there's only one thing, and that's the redemptive act of God. And he said, I will die a satisfied man, no matter what I have made, for serving God. And I remember that shook me, and that stimulated me. I had a paroxysm, and I walked out of there, and I just looked at the ground, and I thought, man, there's got to be something more important than money and fame and knowledge. And that's when I wanted to commit my life. And so we need to shake each other up to ascend higher. So, are you a member of this church? That involves four things. It means I commit to the essential doctrines of inerrancy, the Trinity, deity of Christ, salvation by faith that I commit to those doctrines. It means that I commit to that moral code. I'm not gonna beat my mate. I'm not gonna be an unrepentant drunkard. I'll be a struggling drunkard. I'll be a struggling drug addict, but I'm not gonna do it with a high hand. I'm not gonna be a cheat in business. I'm not gonna abandon my mate because I want a new one. 
And I'm, I'm ready to be rebuked if I do. I put myself under the moral code of the church that binds what heaven binds and looses what it looses. It means that I put myself in the service of this church, that I'm not going to be a fungus among us. I'm going, to, I'm going to take the next generation and be a Sunday school teacher. It means I'm going to be a parker out front or a greeter down here. It means there's going to be order to the church and I'm going to be a member of that church. It means that I'm going to be part of that church's purpose. I'm going to commit myself to be part of the discipleship process. I'm going to have quiet times. I'm going to be taught. I'm going to see if, find my skill and let God use me to do others. And it also means that I'm going to support, that I'm going to be part of what that body is doing. And so, are you a churchman? It's one thing to be great with God and to know his word, to be mighty in the home, to be mighty in, as a patriot, to be great in business. But I've told you the story before when I was a kid seeing a lawyer in our church, Tom Conway, sit over there and I had emphysema. He would get to coughing. My mother would always point to that lawyer and say, he was about 90 years old back in the 50s, and she would point to him and say, that's a great man. We had the Tom Conway Bible class and the Jewel Conway Bible class and the Tom and Jewel Conway couples class, and he was a godly, pious, old lawyer. And I would watch him with that racking cough, and then I would watch him read the creeds, and I would look at him, a little kid back over here just watching him. And he would read, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried, and he knew it would close his eyes. That's what he believed. I would watch him sing those hymns. And he would, he would from the, the deepest part of his heart, uh, may you would watch him just sing as best he could, like a 90-year-old lawyer who couldn't sing. <laughs> He'd do the best he could. And I'd watch him hold his wife, who was old. I would watch him, when you take your money, remember you'd put them in them little, little envelopes? I'd watch him put his money in. He'd come by us, and we made all kind of noise in the Nelson family. Ching, 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 ching. <laughs> I watched Tom Conway, and he put a check in. He actually deliberately meant to give. He intended to give. And I watched him put it in. And I would watch him all the way to the end. Praise God from whom. They always do that, the doxology. Oh, is that the glory of Patry? Praise God from whom. Oh. That's doxology. What's glory of Patry? Glory be to the. That's what we do after the giving. I thought glory of Patry was the organist. I thought she sang at every Methodist church. <laughs> That dang Gloria, she don't die. <laughs> it means glory to, the, glory to the Father. And I would watch him at the end of the ushers would go forward with the money. And I would watch him stand up. Glory be to the Father and to the Son. And I'd watch him do that. And then at the end, we got to go home. Hallelujah. Praise God. Rum. <laughs> and I'd watch Tom Conway. And I told you the story. Have y'all heard this story? And then they went one time over at Saltgrass Steakhouse, I saw a metal sign that said Tom Conway Bible class in the back. And I thought they had a Bible study at, at uh, Saltgrass. Then I realized it was my Tom Conway. That church had shut down and they had sold everything in that church. That had anything to do with Herring Avenue Methodist. Saltgrass went around and was buying, you know, wallpaper, otherwise known as junk. All right. And they, somebody bought it, and there it was, Tom Conway. And I went up to that guy at the salt grass. I said, that sign means nothing to you. It means everything to me. That man means nothing to you. He means everything to me, Tom Conway. I never met him. I never spoke a word to him. He never knew till the day he died that I existed. But I said, I'll give you anything for that sign. The guy said, oh, we don't sell our junk normally. <laughs> but I told it at this service, and at noontime, 300 people showed up at Saltgrass, said, we want you sign, and we're going to burn your restaurant back. <laughs> and at the evening service, they brought it out, and so back in my office, I've got it, Tom Conway Bible class. 
And ever so often when I'm low, when I'm down, I'll just touch that sign like at Notre Dame when they jump up and touch, touch, run, jump like a champion. I hit that sign. And I just remember that old man was a churchman. And I'll just touch that sign. And that's what I want to be. The older I get, I want to be Tom Conway. I want to die. I'd rather not have the emphysema. <laughs> but I'll have something. And I want to die like Tom Conway. You know, it was a day like this, a real bad day back in London, not London, southern England. In the 1800s, a little 12-year-old boy went to church because he had such a need and desire for God. It was such bad weather, nobody showed up. Even the preacher, they got a cobbler that got up to preach. And he was an old primitive Methodist, and he knew everybody there except this one little fellow sitting in the back, and he just looked at him on this horrible Sunday. And he preached on the one verse he knew, Look to me, all ye ends of the earth, and be saved. And he looked in the back, and he saw 11 people. That was all that was in church. And he knew the 11, but he didn't know that one boy who happened to make it to church that Sunday just because of a need of God. And he looked at him, and he said, Look to Jesus, young man. You look to Jesus, crucified for you, or be forever lost. And the young man, whose name was Charles Spurgeon, he said, I went home, and I did just that. And so maybe on an inclement Sunday, you're a non-Christian and you're here, and I have no idea why. You look to Jesus like Israel did the serpent on the standard and you be saved or be forever lost. Let's stand together and I'll have Kendall come and dismiss us. Our Father in heaven, I thank you for this Sunday morning. Pray that you'd get us home safe and sound. A lot of our folks uh, maybe will, just because of the weather, have to listen to it online, and I pray that you would use it to be a blessing. We thank you for your great mercies, and thank you for this body of Jesus Christ. Thank you for this plot of ground on 380 in Nottingham, whereby your word is held, where it is preached, where it is sought to be obeyed, and where you are loved. And we ask God that in a world gone mad, in a world that has lost its compass, in a world like Hansel and Gretel have had the birds eat their crumbs, in a dark forest that they might see the light that comes from the hut of this body. And we'll ask it through Christ our Lord.